Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are just thankful today to be in this place together. Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory for all that is done. Lord, we are so grateful that you have paid our ransom and that because of that we can be here today and be free, free in you. And so, Father, we just ask that you bless our time together and may all that we say and all that we do bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, it's great to have you here this morning. If you are a, a guest of ours, I want to point you to the connection card. It looks like this in the pew in front of you. Uh, if you don't mind, if you would just take a few moments this morning and just fill that out. Uh, give us what information you're comfortable with. Uh, and then when the offering plates pass by later in the service, if you don't mind. time in kid worship.
can have a seat for just a second. In the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, he says these things. He was made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly already written, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and to the prophets. If you're a prayer warrior like Mary Scott and Jeannie Frew and Chris Schaus and others and Parker and Beverly Spence, you've sang this song with us or if you've been to Men's Breakfast, it talks about come behold the wondrous mystery. So I'm gonna ask you to just sit and sing, and then I'll ask you to stand and sing here in just a second.
heaven, we're so grateful that we can come and worship you, that we can stand in your love, Father. Stand in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, just pray now that we will hear your word proclaimed in the passage that was saying, don't you guys get it? Don't you guys get it? And Father, that's what we have to hear today. Don't we just get it that you loved us so much you gave your son for us. Fill our pastor with your Holy Spirit. Let him proclaim this truth and may we in response want to be burdened to share the gospel. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to wish everybody a happy new year. Thank you. It's so excited to be back with y'all today. We last week we Today we're going to uh, step back into the book of Acts. So if you'll turn in your Bibles or your Bible apps uh, to Acts chapter 3, we're going to uh, read our sermon series that we, we took a break from due to Christmas, and so we're excited to be back in Acts, so Acts chapter 3. of Acts, it tells us that he resurrected, it tells us he appeared to apostles, it tells us that he ascended, uh, but it, that's not the end of the story of Jesus' work on the earth, and so he writes Acts to tell how Jesus continues that works, and so he picks up with the ascension in Acts chapter 1, and he starts to tell us more details about the ascension, and in the ascension, in Acts 1.8, he tells us, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I don't expect you to, but I think it was September, right, that we were in Acts chapter 1. And if you remember that you will is kind of like when your mama says, you will take out the garbage. Right? There's no option there, right? Right? You're not going to say, yeah, mom, yeah, sure, I'll get to it. No, mom, when mom says you will take out the trash, you, you will take out the trash, like right that moment. It's not some future event, right? So when Jesus says to us, you will be my witnesses, where you're at, a little bit further away, or in another culture, or the ends of the earth, that's not an option. We can't read into a command from Jesus something that's optional to obey. So he continues in, and we go from Acts 1, where he tells him to go back to Jerusalem, which is great. He tells his disciples to go back to the place where Jesus was crucified. And where Peter Temple Mount. What I want us to keep in mind as we read it is that idea of not optional. You will be my witnesses. So what I want us to keep in mind is as we leave this place at about noon 05, right, some of you leave this place at 1150, right, but let me just encourage you, there's always a blessing in the benediction. So let me encourage you to persevere through to the end. The Lord will count it to you as long suffering, I promise, if you show that patience, if you'll just find that blessing in the benediction and stick all the way through as we leave this place at about 1205 you will discover that as you go, you can be his witness. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Peter's his witness, and we're to be his witnesses as well. So let's read Acts 3. We're going to start in verse 17, and we're going to go all the way to 26. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the back of the pew in front of you, or the words will be here on the screen for you to follow along. It says, 
And now, brothers, this is Peter talking, and he's talking to his fellow Jews. He says, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we read your word today, and as we are committed to your word, we look forward to how you will speak into us. So Holy Spirit, we ask for you to not, to, to not linger, to not, to not tarry, to, to really to work in and amongst us here today, to be a powerful force for us to know and to apply your word to our life. Help us, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So for us to understand what's going on in verse 17, let me encourage you to simply look at verse 1. You see, Peter and John are walking up to the Temple Mount. And as they're doing that, there is a man who is lame from birth, and he's brought there every single day, and he asks people who are going up to the temple, he asks them for alms. And so he says to Peter and to John, he asks them, uh, can you give me a hand? And Peter says in verse 6, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. Now, Peter, let's notice that he doesn't say, rise up and walk. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And this should be a reminder to us that something has happened in the life of Peter. You see, in Matthew 16, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And Peter takes him aside because Peter is not a humble person in Matthew 16. And he says, Jesus, let's talk. You're not going to die. In fact, nothing bad is going to happen to you. You're the Messiah. And Peter says, right, get behind me, Satan. He sort of corrects him. So Peter is not a humble man. In fact, Peter is so prideful and so self-centered that when he's standing in the court of Caiaphas and three people ask him, are you the guy? You must be the guy. You're a Galilean. You must be one of Jesus' followers. Three times he denies Jesus. I think I just showed four. Sorry about that. Three times he denies Jesus. And he's humbled. That night in the court of Caiaphas, he's humbled. And we see that finally, we see that humility here. Where he doesn't say, in my name, after all, I'm the rock. I'm Peter. I'm the best apostle ever. I'm very, very cool, very, very powerful. Now rise up and walk. No, he says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Something has happened. He's been humbled. And what I think we really need to keep in mind is that when we as God pe- God's people, when we are humble, God shows up. And then when God shows up, you know what happens to that beggar? He not just jumps up, he not just runs around, but he praises God. So when God's people are humble... God shows up and God is worshipped. And so then when we come into this time, this unique time, this hour and 15 minutes every week, what we need to do is we need to walk in here in humility. When we walk in here in humility, God will show up and God will be praised. Okay? That's what Peter shows us in the first few verses of this chapter. Then, you see, this man is, this lame man He's healed, and he starts running around, and we're told then that a crowd gathers on Solomon's portico. You can see that in verse 11. 
So then there's a crowd, and when there's a crowd, Peter just decides, I'm going to start preaching. Okay? So Peter starts preaching, and he offers up five points of rejection of Jesus Christ. He says to those people, those Israelites, those Jews, he says, you guys rejected Jesus in these five different ways. I'm not going to go into it. But he points out five ways that they rejected Jesus. But then he goes on to point out five different ways that God glorified Jesus. And for, for us, what we need to remember is simply this. Every single Christian will face rejection at some point in our walk with Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm not talking about is the hardship that every person faces. Every person faces death, right? Every person, right? Right? Every person faces sickness, right? Everyone's going to see tragedy in their life. But for the Christian, there should be unique rejection that we experience. Now, I have had people who after... A message such as that one will come to me and say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever faced persecution. I don't know that I've ever faced um, uh, rejection. And, and my heart breaks just a little bit because that tells me that you don't then share the gospel very consistently. You see, if we tell people about Jesus, we will be rejected. Right? That's just sort of part and parcel. Okay? It happened to Jesus. He was rejected, Right? The rich young ruler hears, hears all that he's got to do, and he's like, I'm out, right? And if Jesus, is, his re- evangelism is rejected, our evangelism is at times going to be rejected too. So every single Christian should face some type of rejection in our life that is unique to being a Christian. This is not just those times in which you ask some pretty girl on a date, and she says no, right? As well, she should, Okay. All right, I'm looking at our youth. They should say no to you, I promise. (laughs) But every single Christian should at some point in your life face the rejection of the gospel. So if you haven't, you need to tell more people because you will experience it. But here's the great thing. We're told that Jesus also, as I mentioned, was glorified. And because Jesus was glorified, One day, we as his followers will also be glorified. One day, we will die, and when we die, those of us in Christ will go into God's glory. And then at some point, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to raise up our bodies, and they're going to spend eternity with him. We will spend eternity in God's glory. So not only do we face his rejection, we also get to face his glory. And I'm here to tell you, Watch out if you've never been rejected that you will be glorified. Those two go together. Okay? Now, it's in the middle of this conversation. It's in the middle of this sermon that Peter then starts in verse 17 and he starts to explain to these uh, gathered crowd, these Jews, and he tells them, I know that you rejected Jesus out of ignorance, the same thing for your rules. But here's the deal. Where you rejected him, God glorified him. And in fact, we're told that all these things, Jesus' rejection, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, is something that God foretold. And that's our first point for today. God foretold all these things about Jesus. We then, as he sort of explains it, Peter does for us, he then jumps to verse 22, and he tells us these things that God foretold. You'll see in verse 22, um, he quotes Moses in Deuteronomy uh, 18, 15 through 19, and he says these things. The Lord will rise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. Now, this is, again... Like when your dad says, listen to me, he's not just saying, turn your ears to me. He's telling you, obey. Right? You remember those times with your dad? Right? He tells you to do something. You don't do it. And then he says, did you listen to me? You're like, yeah, I heard you. And then you spend the afternoon in your room. So uh, that's my life. So (laughs) my dad said, amen. 
So he's saying, um, listen to him in whatever he tells you. This is Moses, and really what he means is obey him in whatever he tells you. But here's the catch. Those who do not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. So there's a real clear separation. Those who listen and obey are a part of the family. Those who do not listen and do not obey are then cut off. It's really clear, and it's heartbreaking that there are people who are cut off because they don't listen and obey. He then goes on uh, in verse 24, and he says, Well, um, all those prophets spoke of this, of what God foretold through them, all the way from Samuel to all the other prophets, right? You are the sons of the prophets because you're Jews, and the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and all... um, and in your offering, offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And what he's doing is, is Peter is summarizing uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And if you're familiar with that passage at all, I'm not asking you to turn there. You see, in Genesis 11, we're introduced to this guy at the very end of that chapter, this guy named Abram. And all we're told about Abram is, you know, some details like who his daddy is, who his nephew is, who his family is, and who he married. That's all we know about him. Then we step into Genesis 12, and God speaks to Abram. He's still Abram at this time. And he says, Abram, I'm going to send you to a new land. And in that land, I'm going to make you great. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Peter, he looks at his countrymen. He looks at his fellow Israelites, his fellow Jews, and he says, friends, God has done all that he foretold through the prophets. All the way back to that promise from Abram, turned Abraham, that all families of the earth will be blessed through you. Well, guess what? It is fulfilled. Jesus has come. All nations will be blessed through Jesus. So he tells them then, it's time for you to believe. That's simply what he says to them. You see, in verse 19, he says, Repent and turn back, but your sins may be blotted out. He tells this group what they've done wrong. He tells them about their heritage. He tells them about Jesus. And so then he tells them, guess what, friends? It's time to believe. It's time to believe. And here's the deal. I think that there are people in this room. It's a new year. New resolutions. New opportunities. It's a time for a whole new you. And here's the deal. Today is the time for you to believe. Today is finally the day for you to say, yes, I believe that Jesus died to pay the penalty for my sins. Yes, I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. And yes, I commit my life to follow him. Today is the day. Now is the time. It's time to believe. If no other time of the year, now is the time. And in a few moments, you'll have that opportunity to do so. You see, God fulfilled in Jesus what he promised thousands of years before. All nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And you can look around this room. And you can see people of all different colors, all different backgrounds, all different languages, all different pasts. And here's the beautiful thing. In our midst today, we are evidence that all families of the earth will be blessed through Jesus Christ. So today is the day for you to believe. You see, where God foretold that, we're then told in the very same verse that Christ fulfilled it. And that's simply our second point for today. And it's a real simple one. Christ fulfilled what God foretold. You see, as we come out of the Christmas season, there are many, many things that we could walk through, many, many verses that we're going to look at, but I'm just going to look at four. And in Isaiah 7, 14, you know what Isaiah prophesied? He said that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And you fast forward to the Christmas story, and guess what happens? Jesus is born of a virgin. In 2 Samuel 7, 
the prophet Nathan goes to David and says, David, God has promised to me for you that your kingdom will find no end. That the Messiah will sit on your throne forever. And then Matthew 1.1 starts off in this beautiful way. It says, Jesus was born son of David, son of Abraham. It's fulfilled in Christ. In Micah 5.2, right? And my hope for you is that in your reading plans that you will get to Micah this year, right? That's one of sort of the, the last points of quitting. But my hope is that you will get to Micah. And in Micah 5.2, guess what it says where the Messiah will be born. It says that he'll be born in Bethlehem. And in fact, when the wise men, they show up in Jerusalem and they say, hey, we're here to see the king. And Herod says, well, I don't know where the king is going to be born. And I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a little uncomfortable about this conversation because I'm the king and I don't have any babies right now. He says, go get the scribes. The scribes come and they read Micah 5 too. We know that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Luke 2 makes that crystal clear. And then a fourth one. In fact, just for your own information, today is the day of Epiphany in the Christian calendar, right? If Christmas is December, it's like around the 25th, right? January 6th, which is tomorrow, is Epiphany, the day that the, the wise men finally show up and worship Christ. We have another prophecy. I'm just mentioning four, and there's dozens in Hosea 11.1, 1, it says, out of Egypt I will call my son. And we know that to, to, to flee Herod in Matthew 2, Joseph has a dream, and in the dream, he's told to take Jesus to Egypt, and he does. He takes Jesus and Mary, and they go to Egypt. Just four. Four different ways. Now, if you want to, I'd love for you to just be careful about which ones you find, but you could even Google all of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. What God foretold, Christ fulfilled. Now here's the deal. Not only does he fulfill it, I also want us to understand this in the context of the fact that Jesus, he not only fulfills prophecy in the sense that he's born in Bethlehem and all those sort of cool things, but also Jesus fulfilled all the work that needed to be done. You see, when Jesus went to the cross and he died for our sins, no more work needs to be done. But like you, brother and sister in Christ, there are times in which I try to do some of the work on my own. Okay? That when stuff in life happens, I try to overcome, I try to persevere, I try to deal with it on my own, right? It's sort of like I don't want to stop and ask for directions. I'm just going to go. It's like I don't want to ask somebody in the store Right? Where can I find this? I want to find it. And if I can't find it, yes, I'm going to get angry, but we're not even going to go there, right? There are times in our life when we try to do the work. But here's what Jesus has to say to us in Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. And you don't have to turn there. The words are on the screen. It says simply this. Jesus' words to us are these. Come to me, all who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Doesn't rest sound wonderful? Right? We're on this side of Christmas, and we're exhausted, right? We all love Christmas, right? Right? Nobody's knocking. Nobody's knocking Christmas, maybe the way our in laws celebrate it, but nobody's, nobody's even going to mention that today, lest we get in trouble, right? right? Oh, I thought you were in extended session. I'm in trouble now. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Boy, who in here needs rest, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now the sense here is that there is already a yoke on us and we're taking that yoke off and Jesus is giving us a new one. So a yoke was something that was, you know, a, a device that was used either for one person and it helps them carry things or even between two people and it helps them two oxen or two bulls or whatever and helps them carry things. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, 
there are people in this room who are dealing with something today. And you are holding on to it. You are holding on to anger. You are holding on to frustration. You are holding on to a hurt. You are holding on to jealousy. You are holding on to something. Bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, and hatred. And here's the deal. That yoke is heavy. And that burden is weary. And even we Christians can be susceptible to taking those yokes upon us. I wish that we were perfect when we became a Christian, but we're not, right? Thank you, Jimmy. We're not perfect, right? Right. So we tend to take the things of this world, of this world, and we put them on us, and they are burdensome. They are heavy. They are hard. They make us weary. And here's the deal. Jesus says, give those up. Take them off. Hand them over to him. And some people are saying, well, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. He's made it clear. You simply, in your time in prayer, say, Lord, today, right? His mercies are new every morning. And so you might have to say the same prayer many, many mornings. Lord, help me deal with this unforgiveness I feel towards my husband or towards my wife towards my friend, or towards my colleague, towards my parents, or towards this person who hurt me. And you give that yoke, that burden over to Jesus. And you say to Jesus, give me your yoke. Give me rest in this. Help me to forgive. And I promise you do that over and over and over again. You will find it. You will find that rest. He will give it to you. Because He fulfilled. Christ fulfilled. He did the work, and He doesn't want us to do it. Right? He did the work of salvation. He does the work of transformation. He doesn't want us to try to do it on our own. And so we simply give it over to Him. We give it over to Him even daily in prayer, or many times in a day in prayer. How often are we supposed to pray? Paul makes it really easy for us, right? He says, pray once a day. He says, pray five times a day. He says, pray without ceasing, right? So we have that burden. And throughout our day, we say, God, I'm handing it over to you. Jesus, I'm giving it to you. Give me your light yoke. Now, here's where we get this a little bit wrong. You see, and and far too often, It's a problem that we have in evangelism, okay? So I I just want to be really careful and clear here. So we tell someone that the only problem that they have is that when they die, they're going to go to hell. And if they do these, 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 believe these things in Jesus, and then they're going to heaven, that as soon as they pray that prayer and they say amen, all their problem, all the problem that we've told them that they have is met, right? Are you following me? We say, your problem is that when you die, you're going to go to hell. But if you pray this prayer, you're going to heaven. What's going to happen? More often than not, they're going to pray that prayer. But guess what? That's not our only problem. Our problem is that we have anger. Our problem is that we have hatred. Our problem is that we are frustrated and jealous and, and, you know, everything else, right? I I can't even, right, offer up a laundry list. It's far too long. And so here's the deal. Here's what Jesus has to offer you. Yes, he rescues you from death to life, from hell to heaven. But it doesn't say to us, he doesn't say to us, I give you no yoke. He doesn't say, give me your burdens, and then there's nothing expected of us, right? In fact, he tells us, I'm going to give you a yoke. You know what a yoke does for us? It gives us work. So when we become a Christian, we all of a sudden have a job. Are you following me here? So when it comes to evangelism, it's not just that you go from hell to heaven. You go from living for yourself to living for a greater purpose. You go from living in a place of anger and hatred to a place of love and kindness and forgiveness, at least most of the time, right? 
unless you're coming over a tone pass and you're just mad because somebody cuts you off, right? It happens. You're saying, man, colorful Colorado, the driving is colorful. So, <laughs> he does give us a yoke. If today is your day to believe, Let's be crystal clear on this. He has work for you to do. It's loving your neighbor. It's loving him. It's telling them about Jesus. The beautiful thing is that his yoke is easy. His burden is light. The things of this world are hard. Anger is hard. And it hurts. Frustration is hard. And it hurts. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness, and you don't want that in your life. What Jesus has to offer is the freedom from those things. And what he asks us then to do in following him, what God asks us to do in following Jesus Christ, is he actually gives us something that is a joy and a delight to do. It doesn't always feel that way, but ultimately it is. It's a joy and a delight to live for Christ. It's a joy and a delight to follow Jesus. It's even a joy and a delight to be rejected by someone when you tell them about Jesus. Because you've done what his yoke is for you. So the last thing we're going to do is we're just going to narrow all these things down into just what is one expectation that he has for us. What is one command that he gives to us? And it's that Acts 1-8 command. Where God foretold, where Jesus fulfilled, we proclaim. Okay. Now I grew up. I grew up in good Baptist life. Okay, and I grew up understanding that it was the job of the church to do the evangelism. I knew that in my head. I knew that it was my responsibility to tell other people about Jesus, but I didn't do it for the first time until I was in college. So I was about twenty-two. It was really the first time that I said to someone, do you understand that you're a sinner and that sin separates you from God? Do you understand that Jesus paid the penalty for that sin at the cross where he died but he rose again and then you commit your life to follow him? Do you want to do that? And the person I was sharing that with said yes and I couldn't believe it. I said, no, you don't. So I repeated the whole gospel. (laughs) I'm not even lying, right? God uses our imperfections when we're just faithful to him, right? And after about the third time, he said, dude, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Stop repeating yourself. I said, okay. I knew it in my head. Grew up in church. I was there every time the doors were open. Sometimes I opened the doors, right? Right? I didn't know it in my heart. And here's what I'm calling our church to today. That that knowledge moves from our head. Yes, I know I'm supposed to tell people about Jesus. That it moves from our head knowledge to our heart, to where it moves from I know I'm supposed to do this, to I am burdened to do this. And I can't but tell people about Christ. You might say to me, well, Pastor Mark, I can see where here in Peter's sermon that... uh, God foretold and Christ fulfilled. But where in the world does it say that we proclaim? Well, what I'm going to tell you to do is to take, just step back from the text for a second and look at what Peter is doing. In fact, remember that he's got a crowd in front of him and he's telling this crowd about Jesus, right? And I love the fact he's still Peter, so he pulls no punches, right? He says, you killed him, right? And we can even say that today, guys. We weren't there, but that's irrelevant. There's going to be people in that crowd who were not there when Jesus was crucified. But our sin crucified Jesus Christ. Whether we were there or not, our sin crucified him. And he tells him, you ignorant people, right? you got to love that. right? I'm not saying that that should be your first statement when you share the gospel this week. Like, you know... Hey, friend, you're ignorant. Jesus, I'm not saying that. Let's be, you know, Peter was able to do that 
And I don't know that we have a Peter here, okay? So we just be very careful. But he's clear with them. He pulls no punches. He directly tells them their responsibility in sin and then the opportunity they have. When he says, repent and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. And blotted out right is they're gone. Right? It's the beauty of the gospel. And then we know in Acts 4.4 4, that many of those who heard the word believed. Right? We didn't read it, but if you want to look at it, if you can, it says many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, it, for whatever reason, there's weird Bible math sometimes in the New Testament where they only count the adult men. And I don't know, you know, I don't know why either, but that's just sort of life. So there were 3,000 in Acts 2 who came to faith, and that was men, women, and likely teens and children, right? But here we're told that just the men are 5,000. So then, you know, I don't know, if we're doing pastoral math, there's like 5 million people who are now Christians, right? So there's 5,000 thousand men who are believers so easily several thousand people are now part of the church peter proclaims god honors it and people come to faith when that knowledge moves from our head to our hearts and when we're faithful to tell other people about jesus christ we will face rejection but guess what we will also get to see people come to faith in jesus christ and what a wonderful year it would be is if we devoted ourselves to say, I'm no longer okay. I'm no longer okay with my neighbor not hearing the gospel. I'm no longer okay with my friends not hearing the gospel. I'm no longer okay with my colleagues or my classmates not hearing the truth. I'm no longer just going to live this life okay that I am surrounded by people who do not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let's make this year the year that says, I'm no longer okay. Right? It's like that commercial. Okay is not okay, right? You know what I'm talking about? Right? The doctor comes in. He sees the patient. He says, how are you feeling? The patient's nervous. Right? And the patient says to you, what about you, doc? He says, yeah, I'm nervous too, right? Okay is not okay. Right? So let this year be the year that being okay with our friends and our loved ones and our family and our neighbors and our classmates and our colleagues, that we are not okay. Now, they may not come to faith in Christ in droves, but if we are faithful, God will bless it. God will use it. So let me challenge us to share the gospel. To no longer say, I know it's my responsibility, but then say, it's now my burden. And I'm going to go and tell people about Jesus Christ, even if it costs me friendships. Friend, if you're in this room, and you just thought, man, I'm going to go, I'm going to go try church. It's January. I'm going to go try church, and you Googled, for whatever reason, you Googled Baptist, and we showed up. We're so glad that you're here. What you'll find in us is a church that is committed to God's Word. We're committed to prayer. We're committed to loving one another, and we're committed to telling people about Jesus Christ. So if you're new to the area, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I hope that appeals to you, Right? We're not perfect, and in fact, I challenge you to go find the perfect church. We're not perfect. I'm not the perfect pastor. You could tell that, right? It took you about three seconds to figure that one out. But we're committed to those things, and I invite you to be a part of a family that's committed to those things. But if you're here today, and you too, you're like, man, I'm just going to go check out a church. And you've never, right? Never made that decision for Christ. And that's what Peter is calling those people to. Today is the day to believe. He tells them. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Today is your day to believe. And in a moment, we're going to have a time of response. And I'd love for you in your seat to say, okay, today is my day to believe. You might say, well, what do I believe in? It's simply this. You have sinned. You've disobeyed God. 
you've done bad things in your life, you've made big mistakes, and those things separate you from God. But God was not happy with you being separate from him, so he sent his son Jesus, and Jesus paid the eternal price for your sin. He died on the cross, but he rose from the grave, and he invites you to believe in him. But this is, that's not the end of the story, right? You also are taking on some responsibility. You are then taking on purpose in your life, and that's to follow Jesus Christ. And you're in a room of people who follow Jesus Christ, and we don't do it perfectly, but our goal is to do it faithfully, and we invite you on that journey with us. So today is the day to believe that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins, that Jesus rose from the grave, and you commit your life to follow him. And if that's you, the pastors are going to be down front, and we would love to visit with you about that during a time of reflection and response. So I'm going to pray. When I say amen, Chris is going to lead us in song. If you are in need of prayer, we would love to pray with you. If you are in need of counsel, we would love to counsel with you. If you are in need uh, of just a church family and a church home, and what I've shared with you sounds appealing about joining us, we would love to have that conversation with you. But most importantly, if you have not yet believed in Jesus Christ and followed him, the pastors will be down front. We would love to visit with you about how to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so glad and so thankful that you foretold all these things about Christ. You foretold those things about his birth. You foretold those things about his life, about his death, about his resurrection, about his ascension. And you've told us that he's coming back. And so, Father, we're so thankful that where you foretold that your son fulfilled. And so, Jesus, we thank you for fulfilling those things and doing the work that we couldn't do. And so, Father, for those of us in this room who need to cast some cares upon you, I pray that we do so today, that we give you our burdens and stop carrying them around. And so, Heavenly Father, help us do that. Then last, for those in this room, that today is the day to believe. Father, we ask for you to help them believe. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let me ask for you to stand as Chris leads in song. Pastors are down front. We would love to visit with you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Just as
I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Just as I am, I could be lost, but mercy and grace. My